Well, welcome, my dear friends, on this warm and crazy Wednesday evening in June. Three short stories for you today, all loosely on the theme of getting lost in the forest on your own, or there and thereabouts. All from Dr. Creepen's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share the stories with me, and I can read them all for you. And, well, this is a bit of an introduction to my second channel, Dr. Creepen's Dungeon. The channel on which I specialize in reading the shorter stories, the kind of things that you're going to be hearing tonight. If you're not familiar with my second channel, I'll leave a link in the video description. Go check it out, there's lots more stuff over there for you, as well as over here. Now my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and a listen. Walking in the forest of Blackmoor at night has proven to be a foolish thing to do purely because of what stalks them after dark. My mother told me, when I was very young, never to go walking in the forest after dusk. But I, young and foolish as I was, went anyway. In a regretful moment of youthful rebellion, with no means of knowing my way back and no torch to light the way, I entered the dense forest with three friends as the rapidly growing dark of night chased the sun below the horizon. As we walked, many thoughts flickered through my mind. Many questions, but the most prominent was, Why? Why are we doing this? What do we hope to find or achieve? This I wondered, and despite my instinct strongly advising me to turn back, I continued onward. We'd reached a clearing in the middle of the forest, when I heard something crack beneath my weight. I cast my gaze to the ground, I saw bones, the skeletal remains of man and beast alike, laid scattered amongst the dry autumn leaves. The smell of decay polluted the air, attracting dozens of sizable flies, bloated by rotting flesh. Oh, we've entered a wolf den, one of my accomplices pointed out, horrified. Certainly seems that way, another agreed. The next words spoken were full of fear. It's here, the first speaker whispered. What's here? I asked, my ignorance only a front, for we had all heard the legends. We had all spoken to, or at least been told the tales of, someone who'd known some unfortunate soul who dared make the journey into this forsaken place after Sunday. Never to be seen again. He looked up. The full moon was a radiant jewel set in darkness. Look at it, he hissed. It's full. We're as good as dead. Another accomplice, the only other girl, laughed. Don't tell me you believe in those silly super... She hadn't the chance to finish her sentence. For at that very moment, a bone-chilling howl split the air. It was that of a wolf, but higher in pitch, hungrier. One could even say bloodthirsty. Most important, it sounded close, very close. We stood still, our only movements fearful shivers. For of what could burst out at us at any moment? What was that? she asked. Her sneer reduced to a frightened whisper. No one answered her. My first accomplice, the one who'd pointed out the phase of the moon, ran forward, shrieking something my fear-frozen mind couldn't decipher. Bones and dried twigs cracked and crunched beneath each step. He disappeared into the darkness that lay behind the trees, and we were too afraid to stop him. Shortly after... A blood-curdling scream slaughtered the silence of the night. I assumed he'd made a terrible end and that we'd be next. Sometimes I do so loathe being right. An enormous figure burst through the trees before us. A wolf, but it was no ordinary wolf. It was huge, as large as a small horse. It was the most magnificent thing I'd ever seen. Silver, 
black and white, with bright yellow eyes that reflected the silver moonbeams. The fur on its muzzle had been stained red with fresh blood. The girl swallowed her words, along with the lump in her throat. The beast charged towards us, and since she was closest to it, grabbed her and tore her to shreds right in front of us. Rachel was her name, and I shall not soon forget her screams as the beast ripped her open and gorged upon her insides. I realized I was screaming and crying, whether out of fear or loss, I do not know. I closed my eyes. So did my last remaining accomplice, Jonathan. We were awaiting death. Instead, to my complete astonishment, three gunshots echoed through the emptiness of the space we were in. I cracked an eye open, and then followed it with the other, just in time to see the last bullet pierce the wolf's chest. A man dropped from the treetops above, shouting some unintelligible battle cry. He landed on top of the wolf, and it was then that I realized he was not yet dead. The man raised an exquisite silver dagger above his head before swiftly bringing it down, plunging it into the wolf's heart. The creature writhed and thrashed wildly. Its blood splattered the man's velvet coat until it eventually became still. The man let go a sigh of relief. He stood, taking a step backwards. Where a monstrous beast had once been, a beautiful woman lay. Her pale, naked form, broken and bloody. Her black hair was matted with sweat and blood and dirt caked itself under her fingernails. He dropped the dagger and knelt beside her, crouching as if kissing her. And thus he stayed for several minutes as we stared in shocked astonishment. When he rose, I found my voice. Thank you. It was all I could manage. I was still shaking like marsh reeds in a thunderstorm. He grunted in response. I looked over at Jonathan. He was staring in wide-eyed awe at our rescuer. Who are you? he asked, the excitement of survival practically dripping from his words. The man turned to face us. The wide-brimmed hat he wore dipped low over his eyes, obscuring his features in shadow. It matters not who I am. His voice was a deep rumble in his throat. But what? His pistol was in his hand, cocked and loaded. Before I even had time to blink, he fired at Jonathan. The bullet struck his forehead. A crimson bead welled up in the wound and then ran down his face. Jonathan pitched over backwards, dead. I was screaming again, and this time I was sure it was fear. I turned and ran, as fast as my legs could carry me, back, as far as I knew, the way I'd come. But he was next to me in less than a millisecond. His speed was supernatural. I veered left and tripped over a thick root. I looked up, and he was standing over me. I felt tiny in his elongated shadow. The next thing I knew, I was being dragged back to the clearing, the cold, damp forest floor scraped by in a blur. Rough stones and undergrowth tore at my bare skin and clothing. When we were back in the clearing, he threw me down on the ground with such force my right shoulder dislocated, and then he hauled me to my feet. I was too scared to do anything but stare at him, plea for mercy in my tear-filled eyes. A wicked, white-toothed grin tore through the shadows that covered his mouth, and he grabbed my injured arm, pulling me closer. I slammed into his chest. It felt like I'd run into a brick wall, so solid and cold he was. I was holding my breath, but I could smell him. The scent of pine trees and death overwhelmed my senses. I wondered briefly, what his intentions were, but didn't need to wait long to find out. He grabbed a fistful of my hair, 
and violently jerked my head back. He lunged fast as lightning. I tried to pull away, but it was too late. Fangs, sharp as needles, had already pierced deeply the skin of my throat. I began to choke as blood bubbled into my trachea. As death tightened his icy grip around my soul. I was alive for far too long. Pain enveloped my entire body, and I couldn't even scream. Eventually, the pain subsided. And first, I lost consciousness. Then breath. Then life. He put me on the ground beside the woman's corpse. I lay there with my unseeing eyes fixed on the silver moon. I was dead. In freshman year of high school, I had a classmate. I don't remember his full name, but his first was Peter. But his name wasn't what struck me. It was the way he was. He always wore the same thing every day. A long-sleeved flannel shirt, regardless of the temperature. Navy blue cargo shorts, also regardless of the outside air. Black socks, grey shoes. He never expressed any emotions. He always just looked bored. His midnight black hair swirled like a galaxy, and his eyes were both the exact same colour as cold steel, and they also felt like it. Every time I made eye contact, whether on purpose or not, a cold chill would run laps around my spine and down my arms and legs. Whenever he sat down, he would place an ankle on his other knee. Every ten minutes or so, he would switch to the other leg. I only had Peter for one class, and that was in the string orchestra. Now, I myself am a violin player, one of seven, and he was a cello, one of six. Whenever our orchestra teacher addressed his section, he would keep his gaze on the front row. Peter sat in the third, even if he was addressing Peter's stand partner. I only have one experience with him that I remember that happened outside of class. I was headed to gym class as he was leaving. One of the jock types slammed into Peter's shoulder while passing him. Peter stopped in his tracks, and the jock turned around. Watch it. That was the only thing the jock ever said. Peter fixed his cold steel eyes on the jock's brown ones, and he said nothing. One of the jock's friends put his bag down. Peter didn't break eye contact. A few people, me included, stopped waiting for the fight. But it never happened. The jock turned around and unsteadily commanded his friend to do the same. Peter still said nothing, just watched, but he was smiling. It was small, barely noticeable, but a smile nonetheless. His shoulders twitched as he gave a small, soundless laugh. His eyes were no longer cold. They were brighter, and I realized that one was blue and the other green. It was muffled, almost as if they were still fighting for the steely color but it was there. As he passed me, I heard him mutter one word. Delicious. I think that's when my intrigue started to become obsession. Eye contact still resulted in the chills, but they weren't as intense. The orchestra teacher would flick his eyes towards Peter every few minutes, and every time he did, Peter's own eyes would snap to meet them. In my second year, I had two classes with Peter, history and orchestra again. At this point, I could hardly keep my eyes off him. He would occasionally look at me, and whenever our eyes met, the chills would come. Eventually, I got used to them. But the headaches were new. They thundered across my forehead, then down to my mouth, ending behind the eyeballs. Whenever I told my friends about them, they were quick to dismiss my observations in favour of menial gossip. Who cared who was dating who? It didn't affect me whatsoever. I only cared about Peter. His life, his nature. 
when we got paired up with two other classmates, Ryan and Bailey, for the first semester final project, I was ecstatic. Genuine interactions with Peter. I could learn so much. I could ask him about anything. But he only said five words that first day. When we got the list for the project parts, he read over the list and said, I could do slide three. The weekend before we gave the presentation, he asked if I would be willing to come with him so we could work on the project at his own home. And needless to say, I accepted. As we were walking home, me behind him, he took out his phone and began to type. I drew closer, trying to see what he was saying and to whom. But his phone was off. He merely tapped the screen where the keyboard would appear. In an instant, I felt muffled fear. And then, I was staring into his face. He had me pinned to the tree at one end of the park, nearly 300 feet from where we were a second ago. Bark dug into my back. My head slammed into the trunk. Stars fluttered across Peter's face. His eyes were shining silver. A grin split across his face. Long, sharp teeth, like bone-white blades of grass, stood in criss-crossing chaotic rows. He spoke. You can't imagine how long I've waited to feed. I waited for the teeth to pierce my skin, but they never did. I only felt a trickling sensation, like water was running down my forearm. My fear rushed away as this took place. Peter's eyes were no longer silver. The cold steel blue and green were replaced with sapphire and emerald hues, which almost blinded me. Thank you. He released me, and the sensation stopped. I figured I would be afraid, or perhaps relieved that it was over, but I felt none of these, and that didn't surprise me. Nothing did. I soon saw my eyes were now that steely grey which matched Peter's at the beginning of last year. My orchestra teacher regarded me with the same fear that he did so with Peter. My friends slowly grew away from me. I didn't care. Their stories weren't boring, but, well, I found it hard to stay interested in anything. We gave our presentation. I wasn't nervous. Peter was. When I saw a spider in my room, I wasn't worried. I killed it without a second thought. I found that my crushes had been broken. I no longer hated my science teacher or loved my English one. I felt the hunger when I bumped into some freshmen in my junior year. It felt like my shoulder had been covered in dust, and he'd thrown it all off when he hit me. The hunger felt cold. No amount of food could satisfy it. I knew what I had to do. I called up Bailey and told her I wanted to reconnect, and if she would be up to getting some McDonald's this weekend. Yes, Taco Bell worked as well. When she greeted me, I made sure not to touch her. We ordered and we talked. I didn't care. The food tasted all right. I spilled my drink on my pants. The drink was cold. Now my legs were. She said sorry. Asked if I needed a napkin. I said no. It'll be fine. Just keep talking. We both finished and she hugged me. Said she'd be happy to do this again. The moment my arms closed around her, I felt warmth like someone had poured hot water over my head. I felt my pulse running through my fingers again. I felt happy. I felt sad. Angry. Scared. Love. Hate. I felt alive. When you were a kid, did you ever go out into the rain to play? I did when I was small. Me and my family would play tag in the rain, 
and even run under the eaves troughs to see who could take the cold water more than the others. <laughs> Needless to say, we would end up getting sick sometimes. These days, I don't bother doing anything when it starts to rain. Mostly because I'm a lot older now, and when it rains out, my bones start to ache. And let me tell you, you've never felt more useless than when walking and needing to take a moment because your legs hurt, or needing help because your hands just don't have the power they used to to open up a simple jam jar. Well, let me tell you about this time I enjoyed playing in the rain. The year was 1952. The sky was dark and grey, and you could feel the moisture ionising in the air. Me and my brothers and one sister were getting excited to go outside to play. This was most definitely our happiest time growing up. We all stripped down to as minimal clothing as we could to get ready to go outside. I sat next to the front window to wait and watch for the rain to come down when I noticed something peculiar across the road. It looked like a young man just standing under a tree waiting for the rain to come and go. At this time, this wasn't strange, as in our community, the next-door neighbor's house was ten minutes in either direction, and the property across from ours was the only one that had a tree big enough to stand under without getting wet. The man seemed off, smiling a smile that went crookedly from one side of his face to the other. Creepy enough, so that I went outside to get my mum, as it just didn't seem right for this guy to be watching us like a creeper. As I was on my way to get my mother, I noticed it. It was a sickly sweet, heavy dinge smell. The smell you get when your mum pulls expired meat out of the fridge. Nowadays, I know that smell as decay. That's when I knew I had to turn around, as I did. I saw my sister walking over to the man under the tree. And now I remember screaming for her to stop. But she didn't. She kept going as though she'd never heard me. The man was waving her over, and that's when I noticed what I didn't like about the man under the tree. He was thin, really thin, like skin on bone thin, and his skin was weird. It was pale, but on one side of his face, it looked like half his head was covered in a bruise that was purple, but turning yellow, and his movements were stiff and jagged. As soon as my sister reached the man, they grasped each other's hands and turned to run off into the field. I told my mother, and she immediately called the police, and my dad ran outside to find my sister. Needless to say, my sister was never seen again. Well, not alive, that is. My family took it really hard. My mum and dad wouldn't let us go outside to play on our own anymore. One year after my sister disappeared, on a rainy night, I noticed something standing across the road from my house, staring into my window. When it noticed me, it started to wave at me. I closed my curtains and jumped into bed and pulled the covers over my head and closed my eyes. Eventually, I fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up, believing it was just a bad dream until I smelled something gross but familiar. I opened my curtains to see a message written on my window in this nasty, yellowish-grey-pink goo. It read, Come play with us, Erin. We miss you. I yelled for my dad. He came to my room in a hurry, with a look of worry and fear on his face. The moment he saw the message on the window, he called the cops. When they showed up, they took pictures and dusted for prints, and for some reason, they took a sample of the goo. The next day, my parents got a call from the police. The fingerprints came back as a set matching my sister's. This gave them hope, but I knew it wasn't her. One man asked me questions about this tree man. At the end of the interview, he said, Hey, buddy. If you see the tree man again, don't go near him and call us right away. He handed me a small card with a number he could be reached on. Something was telling me they knew something about the tree man. And this man went into a room with my parents after the talk. 
My parents cleaned out my sister's room and we packed and moved two weeks later. Now I found that my old family home was up for sale two years ago and I jumped on it. It's gone through over 10 owners since we owned it. When I moved in, it felt like I was finally home. The place I belonged to. It gave me great joy, that feeling. But two weeks ago, that feeling disappeared when, on a rainy day, I was sitting in front of my window and I saw the outline of what looked like a little girl. I shrugged it off. With it raining outside, she probably just was trying to get out of the rain. When the rain lightened, I went outside to get my mail. While at my mailbox, I noticed it. A smell that seemed familiar to me. It was a sickly sweet smell that overpowered my senses. I coughed and turned to go back inside the house. When I heard a voice say out loud, Erin, you're home. We missed you so, so much. His voice sent a shiver down my spine. I slowly turned to look. This person looked so familiar that I could have sworn I knew her. And that's when everything came back to me. This small, pale girl with a huge bruise on one side of her body was... Well, was my sister. In that moment of realization, she turned and ran the other way, towards a field. I hurried back into my house, swearing that I couldn't have seen my sister's ghost, but it was so real. Last night, I headed to bed early because of the rain outside. At around two in the morning, I heard something knocking at my front door. I got up, went to the door, and almost opened it. And I got this strange, ominous feeling. So I turned on the porch light, and the shadow of a little girl was cast onto the window. And I heard, Oh, Erin, you ruined the surprise. Don't worry, though. You're going to come play with us soon. Then I watched as the shadow slowly walked away from my door. This morning, the news forecasts rain for the next few days. And it scares me because the thing that looks and sounds like my little sister has tried to get me to come outside every night that it's rained. And with this forecast, I don't think I'm going to be able to say no for much longer. Tonight was the worst night yet. My sister came to see me, and this time she didn't leave. She walked from my window to my door, softly saying, then, at 2 a.m. this morning, her voice changed to a raspy, gurgly, low-pitched, angry-sounding voice, filled with anger, and I finally broke down and screamed at her. I know you're not my sister, because she died when I was just a boy. Then she stopped talking and exclaimed, Oh, Erin, you're ruining all my fun. Don't make me come in there to get you to come play with us. My heart sank. All this time I believed she couldn't come in the house. It never occurred to me she just didn't want to. This might be the last time any of the people reading this will hear from me. Today I got a reprieve from the rain. It isn't being forecast for this week. I'm going to go out and buy myself a nice shotgun and a ton of buckshot. Then I'm going to wait until it rains again. When it knocks on my door, I'm either going to rid my home of this child-stealing monster, or, well, I'll be dead. So the next time it's raining outside, you see a 70-year-old man with an ominous evil smile and smelling something foul. You'll know I failed, and that you need to run. Run like your life depends on it, because I don't think you'd want to come play with us.
crazy, crazy weather here in Istanbul at the moment. It's hot as hell, humid as anything, and it feels like it's going to thunderstorm at any moment. I think we need a bit of rain to uh, clear the air a bit, but, well, we'll just wait and see. Well, that's another one from me. Another evening done and dusted. But I think I've left you wanting more, haven't I? Have I? Oh, don't you worry, I will be back again on Friday with another fantastic story for you. And, of course, again, all next week and for the foreseeable future. Let's wait and see, eh? Well, my dear friends, that's enough for me for one evening. Until next time, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?